This is the third part of our uh, focus on these verses between 6 and 20, which I'll read to you now. And our focus this morning is on verses 14 to 20, but I'll read the whole passage. Revelation 14 and verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And an angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in this image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshippers of the beast in this image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar. The angel has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Let us pray. Father, I thank you that you have put it in the heart of all your people to be here this morning, though most surely knew that the content would be grim. I thank you, Father, that they have not shrunk back from your word, but desire to know it, to hear it, and to respond to it. And now we all pray together, Lord, as we come under this word, that you would glorify your name in our understanding of it, and in our grasping of it, and in our glorying in the cross. For ultimately, Father in heaven, these things drive us to that holy place. So, Lord, glorify your name in our midst. Help me, I pray, in my weakness, and help us all uh, to hear, to have ears to hear, and to overcome. Amen. Sin, death, and judgment. The three things that generally people want to avoid hearing about at all costs. Sin, death, and judgment. There are often unwelcome conversation pieces, even we are told harmful for a person to believe or think about. Or if they must come up, they need first be sanitized to fit into the new culture. So sin, for example, is no longer called that. It either has no name because it is no longer considered to be it, to be sin, or it has new names. So the fornicator becomes the player. To commit adultery is to just have an affair. To be sexually immoral is to sleep around or to be sexually liberated. 
to poison and decapitate a baby in its mother's womb is just called terminating a pregnancy. The thief is called the kleptomaniac, the rebellious child now has oppositional defiance disorder, and the drunkard is called an alcoholic. And it shows the extent of the fall that sin has come to influence even language itself. Then death, another unpopular subject that is either played down or pushed out of view. Death is practically marketed on retirement home billboards as a gentle and easy process. We've also removed death from our speech. We say, they passed away. They didn't make it. He kicked the bucket. She checked out. And whereas for most of history, death was likely to happen in your home, in your bed, surrounded by loved ones who would be on hand to offer any comfort they could in those last days and hours, standing vigil, it was something regularly seen, it was something entirely familiar, it was a family affair. Today, you might die in your bed at home, but more likely in a hospital or a care facility, and, and for good and obvious medical reasons. We don't deny that, but with the result still being that there's this distancing from our experience. We are pushing death away. You may have an open casket at a funeral as a reminder of mortality and decay, but you're more likely these days to have a memorial service or a cremation, again, as a matter of preference and no problem, uh, but with the same effect of distancing ourselves from this painful intrusion into our daily affairs. Even the death penalty has been removed for most countries or if it's carried out, it's done quietly behind closed doors and never as a public warning, again, for various reasons. But death has been scrubbed from sight, speech, and experience. Sin, death, and judgment. Most often, entirely dismissed or ignored by the world, and the assumptions either that everyone goes to heaven or that there is just nothingness, oblivion, but certainly no great reckoning before God unless it's for an exceptionally bad dictator of some or other kind. But even by the church, judgment is downplayed. Some churches will not dare to mention the final judgment or call sinners to repentance. And certainly they would not sing about judgment. I recently heard about a church that changed the lyrics of In Christ Alone from saying, till on the cross when Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, to say instead, the love of God was satisfied. Because, quote, people don't want to hear about wrath. And I heard a, super, a Sunday school superintendent at another church refer to hell as the not-so-nice place, or something along those lines. A sin, death, judgment, these are so unpopular, we try and change them with our speech, push them out of our sight, because we don't want to hear about them. And this is where Revelation is such a counter-cultural book. Because whereas man's inclination is to push these things out of sight, Revelation drags the whole matter into the light. And whereas people create words that tone down these things, Revelation does the opposite. It uses all the descriptive power of human language to sharpen, heighten, and amplify the ugly realities of sin and death and the awful consequences that follow. And if I ever draw your attention to these things, it's not because I'm going for shock value, though there is sometimes a place for that. It's because to fail to say explicitly what is explicit is to suggest that the Spirit of God didn't quite know what He was doing when He inspired this. So, so far we've seen in this section, verses 26 to 20, that there are seven characters. In verses 6 to 11, three angels, warning of judgment of a grim reaping. In verses 15 to 23, more angels coming in judgment, enacting the reaping. And between the two groups of three, in verses 12 to 14, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, first speaking a word of comfort to the church, and then the Son arriving as the grim reaper, serious and lethal to cut down his enemies. And this is where we begin this morning. First point, the grim reaper and his angelic harvesters. Who is the Son of Man on the cloud, verse 14? Well, you will remember this is sometimes a divine or messianic title. 
In Daniel 7, one like a son of man ascends into heaven, receives glory and a kingdom, an eternal kingdom, with all the people, nations, and languages serving him. And also on the clouds, clouds being like the chariots of God. One like a son of man is who John sees in Revelation chapter 1, an image of the glorified Christ. And Jesus calls himself the son of man about 80 times in the Gospels, frequently in the context of arriving judgment. So there's no doubt as to who we are talking about in verse 14 here. The Son of Man is Jesus Christ, ascendant, glorious, and returning in judgment. We are told He has a golden crown on His head, the Greek word Stephanos, meaning a victor's crown, such as a conqueror or a, an athlete would be awarded after a great triumph. And He has in His hand a sharp sickle, with the word sharp also meaning swift or quick or eager even all of which indicates his readiness, his worthiness, his lethality, and the suddenness of his arrival. It will also prove a bitter irony for his enemies who crown Jesus with thorns and appear to triumph over him when he is shown to return in judgment wearing a golden victor's crown of universal triumph and empire. Now, you may be thinking, but how come, verse 15, an angel is the one instructing the Son of Man to begin the judgment? Since when do angels command Jesus Christ? But understand, this isn't the angel bossing Jesus around. Rather, the angel is a messenger, which is what the word means, messenger, coming out of the temple, the place of God's dwelling, to announce the time of the final judgment uh, having arrived. Uh, remember how Jesus said in Matthew 24, but concerning that hour, that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Remember that? How come are we not told? But Revelation picks up with that imagery. Out of the immediate presence of God the Father in the temple, in the most holy place, there comes a messenger to announce to the Son that the reaping may begin, that the day, the hour has arrived. When will that happen? We don't know. No one knows. No one in the world knows. Not with their astronomy, not with their mathematics, not with their speculations about the Golan Heights, the Gaza Strip, or the West Bank. We only know that the day is predestined, decided, fixed on the calendar because there is an appointed hour. And note that the Son of Man will not be alone when this reaping begins. There comes with Him a trio of, angel, of angels in verses 15, 17, and 18. Three angels, but representative of many more. Matthew 25 tells us the Son of Man comes in His glory and all His angels are with Him. Matthew 13, in the parable of the weeds, Jesus used the same harvest imagery as we see here. And he says, the harvest is the end of the age, the reapers are the angels, just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. Again, with the parable of the net, so it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. So as it were, the picture is of angels being sent out by Christ like sheriffs of the court, to drag rebellious humanity before the bar. And then lastly, chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we read, The Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels and flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Which tells you the, uh, who it is exactly that falls under this judgment. It is those right now in South Africa, in the world, who refuse to acknowledge, to fear God and give Him glory and respond to the message of the cross, the gospel. When you frame sin in those terms, you begin to see how terrible it really is. Sin is to withhold worship of the living God. It is to withhold obedience to the living God. It is to serve one's own interests. Instead, it is idolatry. 
And because of it, there shall come one day when the Lord Jesus, not meek and mild, but as the Son of Man with a golden crown in triumph and presiding over great reaping, will return and send His angelic harvesters out to gather in those who do not fear Him and give Him glory. And, and let's talk about the angels for a moment. We're not meant to seek after angels. We're not meant to worship angels. We're not meant to be distracted by them. Most of Hebrews 1 has spent showing their infinite inferiority to Jesus Christ. He should primarily have our attention, not them. But acknowledging what Scripture says, angels are actively engaged in serving God in history. They saw the suffering of the apostles, 1 Corinthians 4, and they rejoiced over converts, Luke 15. They enact judgments, Isaiah 37, and have an interest in God's purposes for humanity, 1 Peter 1. They serve Christian in hidden ways, Hebrews 1, and bring revelation at times of Israel's history, Acts 7. They are not chubby little cherubs frolicking naked on the clouds with harps on their hands and bouquets of flowers, ringlets around their hair. They are awesome in stature, Revelation 19, and innumerable in number, Hebrews 12. They are terrifying, majestic, holy, potentially lethal creatures whose very presence can create absolute terror in even the best of men, Daniel 10. And one of their functions is to serve as harvesters at the end of the age. And please understand, we're not talking about mytholo mythology here. This is not some abstract idea from an irrelevant ancient book. I'm not trying to entertain you with theological discourse for those of you that have a vague interest in the spiritual or a morbid fascination with end times and revelation. I'm talking about something that you will witness with your own two eyes, either from the vantage point of earth or from the vantage point of heaven if, if the Lord doesn't return before you die. You are reading here of a future that the Bible urges us to believe is absolutely real and absolutely imminent. It's no stretch to say, on the basis of all of what Scripture says about the angels, that there is a vast, invisible host of them, marshaled and prepared and able in an instant to descend upon the earth when the great harvest is called for. Imagine what terror, what seriousness they would be in the hearts of sinners if they had eyes to see them the way Elisha's servant saw the angels marshaled in 2 Kings chapter 6. Like that scene from Independence Day where upon entering the colony ship, the two saboteurs, they see this massive, this incalculably great army, numbers unlike anything they've ever seen before, and there comes the awful realization that everything they've seen so far is as nothing with what is still to come. Now put, a, put aside the sci-fi for a second and imagine what great dread there would be if we could see the holy cherubim and seraphim flaming fires of spiritual power poised to invade the earth. Imagine those warrior angels lined up, ranks upon ranks of them, myriads upon myriads, watching humanity waiting like sentinels for the cue from God for the deafening command and signal to rise up and advance with scythe and sickle and fire. It's not an army that will be defeated or resisted by a coalition of earth's wicked nations. Remember Isaiah 37, the angel of the Lord, just one, it seems, went out and struck down 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in a single night. If the holy servants of the Son of Man have such power, then what good will modern weaponry be? Tanks, fifth-generation fighter aircraft, aircraft carriers, ballistic missiles, submarines, special forces, all the weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, biological, cyber warfare, all the armed forces of all the earth, all of it, collectively could not put so much as a dent in the impregnable essence that is one holy angel. 
how futile resistance will be on this day. How futile the living of many today before the eyes of these watching angels as people potter around ignorant, carrying on as if there was no harvest, no judgment, no cup of wrath, no God, no avenging sun, no outraged spirit, no consuming fire until the hour arrives. The great harvest and bloody winepress. And you may be wondering why there appears to be two harvests there, first in verse 16, then another in verse 19, both of which reap the whole earth. And some have suggested the first harvest is Christ gathering in the church, gathering in the wheat, and that the second harvest is gathering in the wicked, the weeds and chaff to be burned. And certainly that is possible, as Matthew 13 shows, there's no problems. Both gatherings in are taught by Scripture. Wheat and weeds, God's people and God's enemies. All the Old Testament background which John usually leans on, all the subtleties of the language here point to both of these harvests here being about judgment. I mean, there's an element of menace to the text, isn't there? Uh, you see someone coming towards you with a bared, sharpened blade, swinging it wide. You don't think he's coming to give you a haircut. You know he means serious business. Listen to Joel chapter 3. I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. I mean, that's the sort of background John's leaning on. The idea here is that Jesus has a sharp sickle swinging it across the earth in judgment. Plus, there are three warning angels, remember, in verses 6 to 11, so we expect three enacting angels to follow, both with sickle and winepress in action. So, verse 16, the sickle swings like a scythe across the earth. It slashes through, through soil and water and stone and concrete reinforced bunkers, and it reaps the souls of God's enemies instantly and globally. Then verse 17, the second angel comes out of the temple, also with a sharp sickle, continuing the pattern of three enactments. And then verse 18, the third angel arrives. But notice something here. There's a difference. Do you see? Because this third angel comes not from the temple, but from the altar. Well, why do you think that's significant? In Revelation chapter 6 and 8, the altar was the prayers of God's people were being offered. And now we find an angel coming from there on a mission of judgment. You get the picture? You see what this is saying? As a consequence of the world's persecution of the church, blood under the altar, and as a consequence of Christian prayers for deliverance and vindication, incense rising from the altar, wrath will come upon the earth. God takes ever so seriously the tears and prayers of His beloved people. You know, we, we're speaking about Canada a lot lately, and rightly so. The, the opposition against the church is growing drastically. And we should pray for the saints there, and we should join on them in our hearts and yearn with, the, with them for, for righteousness to once again be seen. But we should recognize that our very praying is what Scripture says will ultimately bring the judgment of God upon His enemies. You see, all sinners against God in His holy temple. And so angels come out of there on a mission of judgment to uphold his honor. But some sin is also against the church, the bride of Christ. And so an angel comes from the altar to vindicate her, sent on behalf of the groom, the Son of Man. And this angel, we are told here, has authority over the fire. Again, bringing to mind chapter 8, where in response to the prayers of God's people, fire is thrown down upon the earth. That was the initial answer, acts of judgment in history. Now we see the final word, the last and most violent judgment of all, the judgment of hell itself. 
Your prayers are powerful. Exceedingly so. And now look at the picture the Bible paints for us in what follows. It is of a great wine press, verses 19 and 20. And you know what he's talking about. You've seen this, right? Imagine a scene from a rural farm, from a vineyard in ancient Israel. And each season there comes the time when those clusters of grapes on the vine are ripe, when they're full, when they're ready. And so the, the owner of the vineyard, he, he sends out his harvesters, sickle in hand, to gather it all in. And they spread out to the four corners of his fields. They lay hold of each bunch. And they, they slice them from the vine. They, they hold each bundle in their hands. They feel that surprising watery weight sort of sagging and overflowing over their palms. You, you know that feel of a, a rich bunch of grapes? Every one of them is bursting with juicy redness. It's just the right moment. And, and they bring it all into the wine press, this huge basin, this like a great stone bath. And each harvester, they, they throw those weighty clusters of grapes into that vat. They fill it up. There's no need to be gentle. They're about to be crushed. They throw it in there. And then some of them, they, they sort of hoist up their robes, and they kick off their shoes, their sandals. They, they climb in barefooted, and they begin to, to trample the grapes under their feet. Uh, those grapes, they, they rupture. They pop. They spill their content under the irresistible weight of the one that is crushing them. And on and on it goes in the wine press, this squelching, this pulverizing, this trampling. And all the while, out of a little hole at the base, there flows the juices into a channel that pulls together near the base so that it can be collected for a, a bottle, an amphora, a wineskin of some kind. You've got the picture, right? How is John using this picture? Verses 19 to 20. The vineyard is the world. The owner of the vineyard is God. The harvesters are the angels. The grapes are sinners, men and women. The great wine press is the place dedicated to the outpouring of God's wrath. It is a picture of hell. The trampling is the Lord's furious vengeance. The flowing juices are the flowing blood, the juices of rebel humanity, and the pooling at the base is the vast and terrible outcome of it all. It is a grim reaping. And what is it telling you? What's the picture saying? Not that this is what hell literally looks like. No, it's a picture. But the picture tells you that this last judgment is every bit as terrible, gruesome, and violent as it announces itself to be. To be sure, there's nothing cruel. There's nothing excessive about it. We saw that last Sunday. This is perfect, praiseworthy justice. But there's no denying its horrific nature. And again, let's, let's avoid the excessive literalism um, that, that's become often a part of the church and reading the last part of verse 20. Uh, I remember as a child being told that one day in the future there'd be a great battle involving 200 million horsemen literally wading through blood up to their bridles and a bit like the, the aftermath of the Boxing Day tsunami wading through all of that water and that this was what it was going to be like. I was given the picture, quite accurately probably, but not as meaning. And again, the, the blood covering 1,600 stadia there. A stadia is a unit of measurement, of distance. Uh, that, that's not a literal geographical dimension pointing, pointing to an area roughly the size of, of Palestine, depending on where you decide to draw the borders. Remember how uh, numbers in this book are all pregnant with, with meaning. So if we are consistent with the way Revelation uses numbers and multiples of those numbers, then this probably means something. And I'll give you my best attempt based on previous use of numbers in this book. In Revelation, the number four always stresses universality over creation. So in Revelation 7, four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, or the four living creatures standing for all creatures. It's universality over creation. And the number 10 stresses completeness, hence 
We read about ten days or ten horns or ten crowns or one-tenth of the whole. So if you really wanted to make a point about universal four and complete judgment, ten, what might you do in apocalyptic literature? You multiply it all. Four times four multiplied by ten times ten equals sixteen hundred. And what does the blood at the the horseman's bridle mean? Well, it's speaking about this universal, all-encompassing, absolutely thorough judgment upon the earth, like blood pooling far and wide. It is total, it is terrible, and it is utterly inescapable. And by the way, this, this isn't the first, and it won't be the last, and it's certainly not the most graphic picture of this type of wine press. You're gonna, you heard about it in Joel 3 already. You're going to hear about it in Revelation 19, an even greater gra- gra- graphic imagery. But listen to Isaiah 63, perhaps the strongest parallel to Revelation 14 in every way, and for that reason cannot be ignored. It comes to us in a question and answer format. Here it, here's how it goes. Question. Who is this that comes from Edom in crimson garments from Bosra? He who is resplendent in his peril, marching in the greatness of his strength. Answer, it is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Question, why is your apparel red and your garments like he who treads in the winepress? Answer, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood splattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of redemption had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. I mean, that is language that is directly used in Revelation 14. Even the drinking, the drunkenness of of being under God's wrath. And this, says the Bible, is what the future holds. For the honor of heaven out of the temple and for the vindication of the church from the altar. The great winepress, the great harvest, and God's wrath. Third, Last point, you and a place outside the city or a city. You saw that reference in verse 20, right? The wine press is trodden outside the city. In context, it means separate from any safety and comfort and blessing that comes uh, to those who belong to God who are in the city, as it were. Remember, Revelation uses the imagery of the new city, uh, New Jerusalem, called a, a city there, uh, a, a picture for the state of the church in blessedness with the wicked left outside the city. And that's what's getting at here in the imagery. Those outside the city are excluded from it. They're facing a rejection and condemnation in that place. But seeing as that has not yet happened, and we're still in an age of grace, allow me to talk to you about another place outside another city with sin being punished outside. Because the picture here should bring something else to mind. Perhaps you may think of Israel in the wilderness with the scapegoat, the animal uh, that was taken outside the camp to ritualistically bear away the sins of God's people. Or perhaps you might think of the bodies of animal sacrifices being burned outside the camp in, in Old Testament times. But if you really had your wits about you, you'd think about what it all points to. Listen to Hebrews 13. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Now you remember this from the Gospels, of course. How Jesus was taken outside the city of Jerusalem, away from the holy temple, and there in a place called Golgotha, called the place of the skull, while wearing a crown of thorns, he was lifted up, crucified, hung on a tree in a, in a manner that every Jew would immediately associate with the curse of God. 
The Son of God suffered there, died there, feeling not just the physical wounds upon His body, but actually taking the penalty due for the sins of His people outside the city. He took to Himself burning judgment. He let His blood be the one that was splattered in sacrifice for those that He came to save. And if this morning you are not a Christian, you have a chance to enter into the benefits of this work so as not to be left outside the city in the great wine press. There is time to face up to the, the realities of sin and death and judgment. You will have an eternal association with a place outside a city. Either you will be crushed forever in a place called hell outside the city of heaven because of your refusal to worship God and obey His gospel. Or you could be saved forever in a place called heaven because Christ died out of a, outside a city in your place. And if you want to be saved, then you must turn to the Son of Man, seated in glory, call on His name, trust in Him, and ask that God the Father would count your sins as fully paid his just, justice fully satisfied because of the blood of His Son. There is still time. The harvest is ripening for judgment, but the hour has not yet come, which means that there's any part of you that is grieved over your sin in withholding worship and withholding obedience from this great God, this great Creator. If you long to be forgiven, if you want to love Him, if you want peace with Him, and you want to serve Him, then call on Him now to save you from sin and death and judgment. In fact, those verses we read from Isaiah 63 earlier on, interlaced between the very obvious and very graphic and very gruesome imagery of God coming to trample His enemies, and, and those robes, the apparel of crimson red, inter, interspersed between it all, with these references that He comes also mighty to save, that He comes to accomplish with His own hand what cannot be accomplished by people. He saves sinners. So there is yet time. But for those who are Christians, and, a, and I know a great many majority in this room are, then consider how this fearful picture of hell serves to increase your worship of God. Because if I say to you, that Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sins and the wrath of God, that is an absolutely true statement. And it is sufficient in itself to, to be a source of everlasting wonder, adoration, praise, and gratitude, isn't it? Jesus Christ died for my sins on the cross to save me from hell. Uh, it's sufficient in itself it is to produce worship. But if I furnish your mind, if Scripture furnishes our minds with biblical illustrations, with apocalyptic parables, so as to convey to you the magnitude of the sacrifice, then appropriately your worship might increase too. Your sense of wonder and thanksgiving grows as you see what Christ has done. And this is what this text does for us this morning, Christians. We have been saved from far more than just a word that we don't like to think about. Because upon the cross, Jesus went, Himself had gone out of the city, and He went to the place where sinners and those under God's curse are found, and He effectively stepped into the great winepress of God's wrath. I don't mean He went to hell. I mean the sort of rage that burns eternally in hell came to Him. It was poured out on Him for a time for all of His people. He offered up His own body, His own life to be crushed, to be trampled under the weight of holy vengeance. His blood flowed in that place. If you are a Christian this morning, Jesus Christ drank the cup of hellfire that you deserved. He drank it undiluted. He drank it full strength. He tasted each eternal drop for you. He was pierced and crushed and wounded and led like a lamb to the slaughter. He received judgment for something he did not do, for things that he did not deserve to happen to him. He was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for your sins. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him and put him to grief, to put his soul to anguish for your sake, believer. Can you fathom 
the greatness of the love of God the Father that sends His own beloved Son into the path of such awful torment to save the likes of you and I, not the righteous, but the wicked. Can we even comprehend such love in the Son? And that He came willingly. This amazing grace, this staggering act of self-sacrifice and kindness to the praise of His glory, hell amplifies our appreciation of the gospel. It shows the wonder and worth of this glorious message that we believe. So I hope you can see why we must resist the urge to dumb down Scripture and reinvent language to say less or less clearly what it says about sin and death and judgment. Because if we do, we detract from the glory of the cross and we obscure the truth from the world and we do harm to our own growth and confession. Sin is not some mildly disconcerting state of being less blessed or missing out on God's best for your life. Sin is cosmic treason against our Creator, sin against one of infinite worth, and yet sin may be washed away by the blood of Christ. And death is not something that can be avoided or dumbed down like the brochures tell you. It's not an end, it's not oblivion, it's an entry into eternity, it's an enemy to man's soul and body, but death has been gloriously conquered and overcome by Jesus Christ at the cross. And judgment is not to go to the not-so-nice place. It is eternal conscious torment in the bloody winepress. But there is one who takes judgment, who took judgment for rebels who withheld their worship and obedience at one point. There is one who died outside the city in my place, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Savior of sinners, His name is Jesus Christ. And let's bow our heads and continue afterwards in song as we praise Him. Our God and Father in heaven, we are hampered at times by our own language and our own feelings and our own short-sightedness that we do not see the greatness of the cross and the glorious gospel. But we thank you, Lord, that books like Revelation and the rest of Scripture show these things to us in fuller measure. And we thank you, Lord, that we can, by your grace, respond to them in song and in prayer and in obedience and in thanksgiving. Help us as we go from this place to make it known to others that they may join us in that great crowd around your throne, celebrating your works of grace and even your works of justice. In Jesus' name, amen.